What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another Friday stream, our System Crafters live streams, where we get together as a community and talk about whatever weird and interesting idea of co idea I've concocted this week. Um, and this week is going to be an interesting one because we I really didn't have any time to prepare, so we're going to figure it all out live. Uh, but it, you know, we've done, we've done that many times, and it's all worked out okay. So we'll just see what happens today. So uh, let me see. I don't have my other laptop in front of me, so I need to check uh, this, the YouTube stream chat on my phone. Let me actually just go set that up really quick. Until then, I'll say hello to some people who are here. Uh, make sure I'm not showing myself. Hold on a second, sorry for that. A little bit annoying. Okay, hello to to Heath, uh, Alexander, Drishal, uh, Ronnie, Luminem, Appenzel, Vladislav, F Society, Tomas, uh, Mark, Andrea, Jimmy from the Dingle loves your Emacs videos. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm crammed in to this place where I have my streaming set up and it's very difficult to drink coffee right now. Luminum says, relatively new to Emacs. First stream of yours that I'll be following. Thanks for your work. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, let me just jump into some uh, updates first. Hey, Benoit, Emmanuel, Anton, Daigo. Uh, so next weekend is Emacs Conf 2021. So if you haven't seen it already, there's a, um, let's see, uh, Emacs Conf 2021 uh, schedule. So if you want to go check out the schedule for that, I'll put that in the show notes. But basically, it's going to be two days, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, there's a number of talks there that uh, have been pre-recorded so that they can basically keep the uh, the time under control for uh, all of the, the speakers. And some of these talks will actually have Q&A component at the end of them as well, which could be pretty interesting for uh, some of these talks. A lot of people who you know from the community uh, and also from the System Craft Crafters community, there's a few folks there, which is great. Um, and uh, I'll be doing a talk at the very end of the second day, uh, which I finally managed to get recorded and uh, uploaded for them. So that's that's good. I think once the um, the conference is over, I'll probably post a talk to my own channel as well if they if they're okay with that. I haven't actually asked about it yet, but uh, if you don't get to see it at Emacs Conf, I'm sure there'll be a, a recording uploaded there. But I'll also put it on the uh, the System Crafters channel too. Benoit says any leaks so far? Uh, leaks of of content? I don't know. I think uh, Sacha Chua's uh, Sacha Chua's video has been leaked. the The page for uh, her talk is uh, there's there's actually a video there. Let's see. Let me pull over this browser. In fact, to the other screen. There we go. Hello to uh, Fundrak. Uh, let's see. Thomas Apple Castaway. Uh, Eric Adolfo Subod. As quality not available, can't change it on YouTube. That's really interesting. I haven't seen that problem so far. Anybody having trouble uh, with the quality of the video and can't actually change it in the YouTube player? Let me check the uh, Hall of Mirrors really quickly and see what the... Uh, yeah, it looks like the streaming quality is okay right now. That's good. Yeah, so definitely check out the Emacs Conf. Uh, I believe that's next weekend. Yeah, the 27th and the 28th. That's Saturday and Sunday. I think it's going to be a good time. I'm also going to do a QA and a um, at the end of my talk. I don't know how long it's going to be, maybe 20 minutes. Don't really know what kind of questions people are going to ask, but if you want to come troll me, then that'll be a good place to do it. I'll be awake. I think it's like 11 p.m. my time whenever the talk goes on, so it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, kind of mental state I'll be in uh, that late at night. All right, so the next thing is that uh, 
probably the world is aware of this by now already because of capitalism. But uh, whoops, I shouldn't have closed that. Uh, next week is Black Friday, and I'm actually going to do a Black Friday sale on the System Crafter store. If you aren't aware of that yet, it's uh, HTTPS store.systemcrafters.net. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I'm going to, wow, what just happened? I'm going to announce it on uh, the YouTube posts, whatever you call that, the community posts, as well as like Twitter and whatnot. So you'll know about it when it happens. But uh, definitely check that out. If you've been waiting to, to grab something from the store, then this will be your opportunity to get it at a bit of a discount, which is cool. And I'm setting this up because next year I actually want to do some a little bit more variety on the t-shirts and coffee cups and that sort of thing, like actually have some different designs and not just the System Crappers logo. So I think it'll be pretty interesting to see uh, what we'll come up with next year. But if you want to get the logo uh, merch that we have up there right now, then uh, next week will be a good opportunity for that. Glad to hear that the quality is okay for other people. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention, actually this week is the first week in probably, was it May that I destroyed my other laptop? Uh, so I had a, a laptop I did all my video recording and streaming on for the first maybe six months of doing System Crafters. And then one day I decided that I wanted to try and get my NVIDIA hybrid graphics chipset working in GNU Geeks. And one of the things I was trying was to go into the BIOS of my uh, ThinkPad X1 Extreme laptop and change the graphics setting from hybrid to discrete, which basically just turns on the NVIDIA chipset all the time without doing this sort of hybrid graphics switching. And when I did that, it actually um, hit a bug in the BIOS that bricked my motherboard. So I had to send the computer away for like two months for them to replace the motherboard. I finally got it back, but then I never had the time to get the computer set up to the point where I could use it for streams again. Uh, so finally, I'm using that computer for this stream. We're gonna see how it goes because um, I had a few issues getting it set up over the last couple of weeks, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I've been using um, Geeks Home on this machine and my main machine that I use for streaming these days, uh, and I've been able to replicate my uh, user level config on both pretty well. So I'm kind of happy with that, but there's still a lot of work left to do to get that into a better state where it's you know worth taking a look at. Um. I think that's it for updates as far as everything is considered. Let's see. Good morning, Dennis. Thank you. Noble and Savage says, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, too many things. Uh, right now, I still can't even push to GitHub repositories or any really any repository on this machine because for some reason, my GPG agent is not authenticating with my SSH key correctly. So um, that's the last issue I have to figure out. Everything else I've pretty much gotten figured out by this point and all my software is up to date, thankfully. I'm on like the latest build of Emacs 28.1 with native comp from the Flat Watson uh, Geeks channel. And uh, it, it broke something today. There's some changes to map into. There's a function I was using for something in my configuration that broke um, or they have a bug or something, so. That was fun. I actually spent about an hour today figuring out how to deal with that. But yeah, that's what happens whenever you're living on the bleeding edge of, of uh, Linux distribution technology. Okay, so today the topic is um, about how to find tools for building a Lisp focused system. So on this channel, we are pretty Lisp focused in terms of the tools that we pick. And um, we focus pretty heavily so far on two very Lisp focused tools, which are GNU Emacs and GNU Geeks. So um, the question today is basically, are there other tools out in the world that you could use for other parts of your system? So if you wanna craft a system that is mostly configured with, uh, with Lisp dialects, then there are a lot of things out there for this, but I'm no expert on every single one of them. Uh, so we're gonna try to go look for them and just basically make a list of all the different types of Lisp focused um, tools that you might wanna use for building a system configuration. Uh, yeah, Star7 says green screen is not proper in the edges, it's moving due to air. Yeah, this green screen is actually one of those cheap uh, circle green screens that is stuck to the back of my chair. So whenever I move, it's flopping. That's great. So um, yeah, so what we're going to do is just build a list of these things. We're not actually going to try any or many of these things today because it's 
with geeks is a little bit difficult to find some of these pieces of software. So uh, the goal will be to sort of just check them out, see what the benefits are of the various different tools, what they can be used for, and then maybe in the future make videos on some of these because I want to start branching out into other tools. So it would be useful to probably make a couple videos on a few different tools that are going to be useful for system configuration. My green screen has dog's ears. Yeah, it's definitely flapping. It's a little bit ridiculous. I hope, it, hope it's not too distracting. Um, let me actually check it for a second. Which side is it? It's that side? Yeah, that, that's the side that's problematic. Look at that. Okay. Maybe that's a little bit better. No, it's actually worse. Here, we'll do this. Okay. There you go. You got the peek behind the mirror there, behind the curtain of the uh, the whole live streaming setup. It's great. One day I'll have to do a video talking about how I do all this, but uh, today is not that day. So, um, first of all, we're going to talk about some things that we've already discussed a lot on this channel, but we just want to run through them to have a good list of everything that we could consider here for the, the set of tools in case anybody wants to go take a look at this list and, um, and research them and try to figure out if they want to use them themselves. So uh, I'm going to start with window manager because that's kind of one of the most central tools that you could possibly use for a system configuration. Um, and obviously the thing that we've talked about the very most on this channel would be EXWM. So it's basically the, uh, the Emacs uh, X window manager. And that's what I'm using right now. I actually have, you know, all of my X windows being managed by Emacs using the EXWM package. Um, and uh, we've talked about it a few times on the channel more recently because of the uh, the situation with, you know, maintainership of the project. The main maintainer of the project or the creator of the project uh, sort of disappeared for a while. So finally, that project has been taken over by one of the other co-maintainers. And uh, luckily, that's got a, a life going forward. So I'm thankful that we'll be able to continue using that. Um, so if you are, you know, very heavily invested in Emacs and you want to have a uh, very list friendly window manager, then EXWM is, is your most obvious choice. Now, another one that people are mentioning in the chat, which we have not talked about on this uh, channel is Stump WM, which is a uh, window manager that's written with a uh, common lisp. And it's very Emacs inspired in terms of the um, the way that you configure it because it's meant to be very the configuration is meant to be uh, very hackable and also live hackable where you could actually have a REPL hooked up to your window manager to send new uh, S expressions or Lisp, Lisp forms to it to change the running configuration. Uh, it's very very powerful, but um, it you know, has its own learning curve, basically. And there are some limitations to it that a few of us in the community have been talking about recently, specifically around um, having multiple displays. Uh, if you use many window managers, uh, oftentimes you have the ability to independently control the workspace that's visible on your different displays. But with Stump WM, for whatever reason, the way it was written does not give you that ability. If you switch workspaces, all of your screens go to that same workspace. So uh, the workflow that I use for streaming and recording would not work very well at all because I kind of want to have one screen that's always on the same workspace so I can kind of keep an eye on the stream while I'm doing different things with different workspaces on my main screen. So um, that is something that, you know, has been discussed uh, multiple times in the development of Stump WM and people have proposed fixes for that, but I don't really know whether that's going to be a thing that happens anytime soon. But um, there's always a possibility that it will get fixed and that will be a something that's not a limitation anymore. Now, uh, I really, really would like to use a secondary window manager for certain things. Like for instance, whenever I do music production, um, EXWM is not really an ideal window manager for that because some apps that you use will have a lot of pop-up windows and EXWM does not do well with a bunch of pop-up windows. Obviously you can write code to try to grab them and place them in certain locations, but a quote unquote real window manager is probably gonna be a lot better for that. So. You know, I've considered using i3 or potentially a, a window manager like Stump WM for uh, for these kinds of scenarios. So I may still try to use Stump for that, um, but like I said, it does have that one major limitation that keeps me from using it for recording and streaming. So uh, another thing that people <clears throat> have been asking about or mentioning in the chat is uh, Awesome WM is uh, a window manager that is written 
is written in C and then it has like a Lewis configuration interface. That's probably the, the situation there. Uh, however, there is a um, uh, a language called Fennel that is a closure inspired Lisp like language that compiles to uh, compiles to Lua basically, and you could use that for your configuration if you wanted to. So um, Lisp style config with uh, Fennel. So um, that is also an option. Now I saw some questions here that I want to, uh, to take a look at really quickly. I've been missing some things as I've been rambling here. Uh, Eric says, I've started writing the Lisp to do system I talked about yesterday in the uh, in the Discord. That's, I didn't see that. That's cool, though. Let's see. Yeah, I had, okay, I saw the, the green screen comments got distracted, apparently. Earthquakes in Greece are not uncommon. That's true, but I haven't, haven't encountered one yet. Uh, F23A Nun says, um, is common Lisp very different from Emacs Lisp? Emacs Lisp could be considered a more simplified version of something like common Lisp. It does have a library that you can use to bring in a lot of common Lisp style features like um, generic methods and uh, an object system. So that can be really useful if you know common Lisp and you're trying to write code for Emacs Lisp. But uh, the core language for Emacs Lisp is sort of like a minimal version of a common Lisp implementation to some degree. But if you learn one, then it's pretty easy to transfer what you know to the other. Uh, EBN says, I use Xmonad my, Monad myself, but don't ban me. Well, now nobody's going to ban you for using Xmonad. This is system crafters. We're, we're talking about the general concept of, of system crafting, and we don't hate people who use things that don't use Lisp. I mean, Haskell is just fine. Uh, let's see. Gavin says, I'm getting close to emulating a workspace per monitor setup. It's not a native fix. Yeah, Gavin's been talking about this on the System Crafters Discord. Um, that is definitely a concern. And, and uh, it's a nice thing that, that he's working on to try to fix it using a, well, quote unquote, the right way, technically speaking. Uh, this sort of concept of virtual workspaces didn't really exist in X Windows or the X Windows system uh, in the early days, typically you're supposed to have independent displays that you have different workspaces on, but that's harder to set up and harder to launch applications on. So uh, people are uh, pe people are kind of missing that functionality. But uh, as a contrast, Windup Boy says, I've been using Stomp for years with a multi-head setup, multiple screens, but my workflow evolved in Stomp, so I don't run into the work groups is the groups issue. I'm actually interested to uh, learn. Uh, what you know about that because uh, if there's a different way to do it or like a better workflow then uh, that'll be really interesting to find out about uh, Gavin thanks for reminding me about sawfish so sawfish is another window manager um, is it configured in scheme or common list I want to say uh, it's scheme let's see let's actually look it up really quickly so let me go to Firefox put it on incognito here um, so Sawfish Window Manager. So Sawfish, I've not tried it. Now I'm getting pages in Greek here, which is pretty funny. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't want to log in right now. Thank you. All right, so cool. So the Sawfish Window Manager, which is the best resource here? Scheme-like language, uh, Gavin says. I believe that. So is it Scheme or Common Lisp, or is it its own Lisp implementation written in C and Lisp? Okay, it uses a Lisp-like scripting language called Rep. Okay, so it's not exactly, um, let me split this actually. It's not exactly a Scheme or Common Lisp, but it's a Lisp-like language, which is fine because this is pretty common in Lisp-based, uh, or sorry, tools that use a Lisp style language to configure them. Let me drop a, a link in on that. Okay, there we go. In a Lisp style language. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So it's called slang. No, nah, yeah, it's, it's definitely rep, but maybe it was slang in the past. This selfish has been around for a very long time. I haven't really used it. Yeah, it's been around since 2000. Um, I've always heard about it, but it's always, you know, if you look at screenshots like this, it kind of looks really old style uh, XORG type 
uh, interface. So not necessarily the most inspiring uh, system. However, I would imagine that, you know, it, there's been changes to it more recently that um, make it look more modern. So it might be nice. Wind up boy says I used to use it. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense that it would be something that Lisp uh, enthusiasts would try to go and use. And uh, it seems to be having some commits still like there was a commit in on May 20th. So uh, people are still working on it, which is cool. Uh, Benoit says it looks like next step. Yeah, it definitely looks like the sort of uh, next step or window maker type uh, window managers. Let's see. What did I miss here? Gavin says, so far I find common list would be Emacs list with better defaults and more features. Yeah, something like that. Uh, F23A8, none. What are your thoughts on Nixt? So I need to add that as something here because that actually matters. Uh, let's see, web browser. We'll talk about that later. Um, Eric says, awesome started as a DWM fork. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, let's see. EC Gade says, uh, which of these WMs is Wayland compatible and which aren't? Well, most window managers that you come in contact with are probably old enough that they're not Wayland compatible. However, there was a um, Stump WM port to Wayland called, I think it's Mahogany. Let's see, Stump Mahogany. Ah, yeah, I just saw it. Uh, okay, so we're, we got like Mahogany tree stumps here. I think I just saw it whenever I was typing, so... Let's do that again. Stump mahogany. There we go. So this one is a stump WM like Wayland compositor. And um, let's see, configuration system using common Lisp. Easy extensibility. Um, so someone told me that this was deprecated that they weren't working on it anymore, but I don't see anything here that indicates that. And there's a commit on September 4th, so it seems like people are still doing stuff here. Let's see, any video demo, Emacs integration, uh, a new managing paradigm. So this is sort of like, you know, actively being developed, it seems. Uh, so yeah, if you wanna use something that is more focused on um, Wayland, I think that uh, Mahogany, hi Bill. Uh, let's see, stump like for Wayland. You could use that instead. All right. Hi, the Christer. Ronnie says you can write BS BSPWM and Barry in a Lisp language because they are language independent. Yeah, well, it's true that any of the window managers that have a uh, command line interface like i3 or Sway or BSPWM, you could, you know, write your own interface on top of it, or you could even control it from Emacs if you wanted to, I believe, uh, because all you do is just shell out to a command line tool and send messages to the window manager. So you could definitely have an API in a Lisp that controls one of these window managers, but it's not really the same as having a fully Lisp uh, window manager. Gavin says, the more I use Stump, the less I feel a need for a workspace per monitor. At this point, I may as well keep working on it for those who would want it. Um, so I, I'm interested to know why you say that. Um, so I can't remember if Stump has the concept of tags, but some window managers have this concept of tags where a win window, a specific window can be tagged with multiple tags and a tag could be associated with a workspace so that... Um, a window can show up on multiple workspaces in some configurations. So that is a possibility, I think. Hi, Thokal. All right, so let's see. What other Lisp-based window manager do we have? I know there's one that was written in Guile, but I don't know if it was ever really meant for um, real, quote-unquote, production usage. Okay, Guile WM. Window Manager Toolkit for Guile Scheme. It was updated last on the tw on 2019. Um so the fact that it calls itself a window manager toolkit makes it sound more like it's a library that you can use for building your own custom uh, window manager functionality. But if you're interested in playing around with Guile and you're interested in trying some sort of development level um, window manager tools, then you might want to give this one a shot. I have not actually tried it yet, but uh, one day I would like to. Guile WM. So let's see, let's paste that in. So um, 
a window manager toolkit for Guile Scheme. What's not implemented? There's a lot more I'd like to do. As you can see, it gets progressively more grandiose and crazy, perhaps. Uh, window decorations. So it sounds like they don't have like window uh, borders and stuff, which I mean, you may not really need that. Built in replacements for those little X utility programs like X mod map, etc. cetera. Uh, did part of X render as a proof of concept. That's kind of cool. Uh, status bar mode line, anti-aliased fonts. Okay, so definitely it's missing some things that you might find pretty uh, important for a modern, modern window manager, but I guess really you don't need anti-aliased fonts if you don't even have windows, window decoration. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they display on the screen. Um, whatever else you want. So this is kind of like a cool starting point and um, it uses Guile XCB. So if you happen to watch the uh, first or second um, hacking or improving EXWM streams that I did, the these hack session streams, uh, we were talking about the XCB protocol, which is basically a XML based protocol that any application can use to talk to the running uh, Xorg server to do window management and to draw things on the screen, etc. Or actually, the 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 thing drawing the screen is a server, so actually the client is one that you're talking to. I think I don't know this. The terminology is a little bit backwards compared to what I'm used to. Um, so the same sort of concepts apply, where you're just you know making a connection to the X work session, and then you're sending requests and getting responses from it using Guile XCB. So if you wanted to get kind of heavy into actually writing a window manager for X on Linux, you could try to use this and build something with it, which would be pretty pretty cool. Uh, Fundrack says, uh, it is possible in StumpWM to save your current Windows organization and restore it later. I'm pretty sure with some work, it could be possible to write something more advanced. Maybe there's already something in the contrib repository. Yeah, I've, uh, Fundrack uh, has a really nice configuration site and um, uh, also a really nice StumpWM config. I was stealing some things from there whenever I was trying to make my own config recently. Let's see. Um, I think I've got it here. So let's just pull that over. I'll, I'll drop it in so people can see. Uh, I think I just saw, where was it? Stump, there it is right there. Yeah, so if you want to check out a stump configuration, check out uh, Lucian's website. Which could be pretty instructive. He's definitely doing it the, the lisp way, as far as I could tell. Um, Mr. DWSK says, Hey, will you ever do a full Doom tutorial making a development setup? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe if people ask enough for it, I might do some Doom videos, but there's already, you know, a lot of Doom videos out there because, you know, uh, it's typically more popular to make videos on that than vanilla configs. Uh, Gavin says, a bit hard to summarize, but I can chat about it in the Discord later. Most of it is I can hack on anything I need. So the more I hack, the less I feel I need the feature. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really interested in your perspective on that. Also, uh, Wind Up Boy's perspective, because you know I have a very specific workflow that I use that's very workspace driven. And if people have other ideas, I'm certainly interested to um, to hear about that. And it could just be that if you have hooks for when you change a workspace, then in your code you could just splat a specific I mean, you could implement your own sort of virtual work workspace concept i think um if you tried hard enough so not really i, I think it's, it's definitely possible so I, if other people have sort of strategies for that i'm certainly interested to hear about it you know stump is something i'm willing to make videos on at some point in the future because it's interesting from just a usability standpoint um and it's, i think it's pretty unique so um if, if people in the community come up with good usage models for Stump, I really want to hear it because I would like to uh, spend, some, spend more time using it and also be able to make some videos on it. So um, other window managers, let's see, Lisp-based window managers. Let's, let's just search real quick and see if there's anything else we're missing here. Obviously, Stump WM shows up. Um, there's CLFS WM. I think I ran across this the other day. And it is quite ancient, and I'm not exactly sure if it is... Um, still being developed sawfish yeah so maybe it's clfswm that's the one that is um another option for this so there was like a news feed 
Let's check the Git repo. Maybe that tells us how recently it was updated. So um, five years ago, it seems. Now, uh, there's there's this tendency we have as people using software to go to a GitHub repo or some Git repository and look at the last commit and say, okay, this is a dead project. But it may very well be that this works just fine because this is using the Xorg APIs that don't really change because they've been around forever. So this probably does still work just fine. I have not used it though. Uh, but it is an op option if you want to try another common Lisp based window manager. And I should say that um, I think all of these are tiling window managers, except for Sawfish. Sawfish is more of a stacking uh, style window manager where, you know, like in Microsoft Windows, where you open windows and they sort of stack on top of each other. I think uh, Sawfish is one that's like that, but you can implement other types of window, window management there as well. But everything else I'm pretty sure is more like uh, tiling window managers. Hey, Anders. So this is uh, CLFSWM, which is uh, full, a really, it's, it's a mouthful. I'm, that's the phrase I'm going for. Okay, whoops. Uh, so it's the common lisp, what's it called? What is the FS? Uh, full screen window manager, common lisp, uh, full screen window manager. Uh, and it looks like, you know, judging from the icon we see, it sounds like it's another one of those sort of, um, <clears throat> well, maybe, maybe possibly a nesting window manager, but it does have pop-up frames. So, uh, I don't know if it's more like, you know, dynamic layout or, or, uh, what do you call i3? It's not static layout, but you, you definitely, you choose a layout uh, more or less. Okay, highly dynamic. Only one frame, the root frame, other frames can be created, deleted on the, on the fly. Another thing about um, any Lisp-based window manager is that typically they follow <clears throat> uh, the uh, Emacs model, more or less. I mean, there's a similar concepts, so it's easy to wrap your head around if you've done any uh, Emacs hacking. Uh, Celtic Orthodox Prayer says, uh, operating systems and user interfaces have gotten too complicated, in my opinion. Well, I mean, I guess you could say that... Uh, whoops, what did I just do? I popped up this. Stay out of here. I don't want you breaking my EXWM session. Yeah, let's copy that and then drop it here for the people who asked. All right. <clears throat> Um, I don't know what other windows are going to open up here. Uh, so anyway, what I was saying is that uh, if you've spent any time hacking on Emacs, you might have pretty decent luck uh, with any of these as well. Okay, so there seems to be more window managers written in Lisp. There's one called Eclipse, which is interesting. X11 window manager written entirely in common Lisp. I haven't seen that one before. Uh, Doors is an attempt to bring essential features of Windows into common Lisp. Maybe it's more like a toolkit for writing a window manager. That's interesting. I've not seen that one before. And 2011 was the last commit on that one. I'll just uh, drop this link to this uh, Seeleaky page, the common list wiki. So let's see. Others on the common list wiki. So uh, yeah, I, like I was saying, a window manager is a very core aspect of building a configuration, especially if you're going for something custom and you're not going to just use an off the shelf desktop environment like GNOME, KDE, XFCE, et cetera. So um, you're going to spend a lot of time configuring that to your taste because whenever you use one of these types of window managers, the uh, interface is pretty basic at first and you sort of have to figure out the workflow and you also have to do a lot of customization to make things work the way you want it to. So if you're going to be spending time, you know, doing a lot of Lisp based configuration with Emacs, it makes sense to have a window manager that allows you to do a similar thing or, you know, configure it in a similar way, I guess you could say. All right. So next, if anybody else thinks of window managers uh, after the fact, definitely feel free to, to drop them in the chat and I'll, I'll go look at them really quickly. Okay. Config management. Now, uh, obviously we have uh, geeks to talk about here because that is the um, I guess the most ambitious, one of the most ambitious, you know, system management tools that we've seen to date, you know, along the lines of like Nix OS, basically, you know, a, a functional 
system configuration tool and package manager is uh, you know pretty it's pretty advanced stuff basically. And luckily we have GNU Geeks, which allows you to write guile scheme code to configure your, your system. And not only your system, you can also configure your user level um, configuration for your user account as well now with uh, Geeks Home. So uh, the first thing to mention here obviously is GNU Geeks and um, uh, for uh, both uh, system and home directory. But I wonder if there's any other tools out there for um, managing your home directory at least. So something like Chez Moi or um, uh, Yadam. How do you how do you pronounce that? Yadam. I don't know. But I wonder if there's a list based tool for that. I don't know. So some of these things I don't. I've never looked it up before. I'm just trying, gonna try to look it up and see what we find. So let's see. Lisp based dot files management tool. I suppose you could say. Oh look, I have one of my videos showing up here. That's funny. Um, I suppose you could say dot crafter is one of these things, but it's not really baked enough yet to mention here. Let's see dot fig. I don't know if, if these actually have, um, lisp. Something like this may not actually need it. Easy dot files management, one stop shop for dot files management, install language specific settings. Okay, this seems like someone's personal configuration. Uh, let's see, Lisp. Okay, yeah, so they're talking about using org mode. I mean, I guess that is one thing you could say is, you know, org mode is an option here, but it's not really Lisp so much as something in Emacs. Uh, Basscast says Geeks manages dot files now. Well, um, yeah, that's what Geeks Home is basically. It's Geeks Home, um, huge potential, but also at the moment, kind of difficult to get started with because there, there doesn't exist like fully baked configuration modules for various different things that you need to use uh, in your home directory. That's something that Andrew Tropin's working on in the RDE uh, channel, where there's a lot of services for configuring things like GNU PG, uh, Pulse Audio or Pipewire, uh, things like that. Uh, I have, I need to start using those because I've, up until now I've been writing my own configuration modules for various different things. And it, it's, it's kind of complicated because with geeks home, you're not really supposed to be just taking existing dot files files and using geeks home to place them. What you really want to do is create uh, m configuration modules for various programs in Guile scheme where you can configure it with scheme. And then that scheme co code will write out a configuration file on your system uh, with the parameters that you've passed into it. So, uh, it does take more effort to get certain programs to be configurable with geeks home. However, it's pretty awesome, uh, to write all that config in scheme rather than having to know all the configuration languages for various different programs. So, uh, it is, um, it's, it's very interesting, definitely very promising. Um, I'll have more to say about that after I spent more time with my configuration and figured out how to use it effectively. Hey, Lord Debbie, haven't seen you in a while. Let's see. Ronnie says dot crafter win. Um, well, the, the thing about dot crafter is that now I don't really need to use it because I'm switching to using geeks home instead. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. We'll have to we'll have to talk about that another at another point. I think. Uh, Seek says, can one use the super key as modifier in Stump WM? I'm used to having it as a modifier. I think you can, but I haven't used it in a while, so I can't say for sure. Lord Debbie says, uh, there's something kind of funny about going DWM with that super focus on minimal code, then pairing it with Emacs that has the exact opposite focus: more code, more features. Well. The way I see it is that um, having a minimal window manager makes a lot of sense if you don't use a lot of windows. So if you're in Emacs most of the time, then DWM is, makes sense because you really only want the window manager to be there whenever you launch an X program that has a window that pops up. Otherwise, your your Emacs frame is full screen uh, most of the time. So uh, it, it does make sense. Because basically, Emacs is your desktop environment, regardless of whether you're using it as a window manager or not, in my opinion. Let's see. What is Jove Emacs? I've not heard of that before. 
uh, open source Emacs like text editor. I have not heard of this. Uh, inspired by Gosling Emacs, much smaller and simpler, lacking mock lisp. Interesting. Uh, Fundrack uh, tells Seek that it's absolutely possible to use super as a modifier key. You can either use your pre prefix, key prefix key map or the top map. Yeah, definitely check out uh, Fundrack's con configuration because it does uh, you know, show how to use key maps correctly. I didn't know that about uh, StumpWM until I checked out uh, Fundrack's config. Uh, uh, Javier or Xavier, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce your name, uh, says Rat Poison pairs nicely with Emacs if you don't want to integrate uh, fully using EXWM, not configured in Lisp though. Yeah, but the thing about those really simplistic window managers are, is that uh, they don't require much config in a lot of a lot of cases. So yeah, it doesn't really matter what their config ling language is. Uh, Bass Cast says, I'm, I was thinking of writing a minimal Guile WM, but I'm incredibly terrible uh, with graphics in Scheme. Well, you don't have to really do graphics necessarily. You you just you know, place windows on the screen and be done. Uh, let's see. So, anything else for configuration management? Probably not. Top ten Emacs Lisp dot files eLisp open source projects. What? Okay, I think that's just some kind of roll up. All right, so probably there's not many things for that, but um, I would say, you know, GNU Geeks is really all you need in the end because it's, it's extremely powerful. And now that we have Geeks Home, um, there's quite a lot of potential there for uh, doing most of your configuration just with Geeks and not having to use another tool for that purpose. Okay, Shell. This is one that's kind of interesting because there are various different implementations of a Lisp based shell around. Um, so how about, let's see, let's see Lisp based command shell. Now, obviously you could say that you, like, like what uh, Ambravar here says in his blog post that you could use a Lisp REPL as your main shell, which I think is, um, hmm, I, I think it's a pretty ambitious idea. It could definitely be done, but it's not really meant to be used. But thankfully, he links to some of the other um, Lisp-based shells that I've, I've heard of in the past, so that's good. But uh, yeah, you could use a normal Lisp REPL as a shell, but if you don't have a good API for that and a good way to type in commands without having to put parentheses around everything, then it's going to be a little bit uh, annoying, I think. So not necessarily the best idea, but I will post a link to this um, just in case people are interested in the possibilities there. So let's see. All right. I want to emphasize that while I use Common Lisp and Emacs as a support technology for my de demos, the thesis of this article concerns itself with a different shell interface paradigm. Oh, okay. So uh, one of these that I've heard of before is called Clash. This is Common Lisp as a shell. I've never used it before, but I've heard it mentioned, and uh, we're going to just take a quick look at what it provides. So let's see, make C Lisp a valid shell. So what's it doing? Um, so C Lisp, which implementation is this? Um, GNU C Lisp ANSI Common Lisp implementation. Probably that's in uh, Geeks, but I'm not going to bother trying to install that right now. Let's see. So yeah, it's been around for a while. Don't really know much about it. Um, disclaimer, use at your own risk. Okay, fine. Last modified 2001. That's, uh, that's a date. So you have to compile it, make it a valid shell, start X. Okay. Set up the reader macro. Okay, so... This is just a blog post telling you how to make your own shell because, uh, okay. It's an API that you, you write a reader macro for. So if you don't know what a reader macro is, it's basically a way that you can customize the, um, the reader of the Lisp interpret, sorry, the Lisp, yeah, interpreter, I guess you could say, 
uh, the reader is basically the parser for the language. So with common Lisp and other Lisps out there, you can customize the parser to add extra ways to parse uh, expressions. And a lot of times what people are doing to make a shell for a Lisp implementation is they write a reader macro where you can put in a special syntax where you can write something that's more like a command line that you would send to a shell rather than a, an S expression. Um, but that is, um, you know, a little bit uh, esoteric Lisp stuff. So yeah, I don't really consider this a legitimate option, but we're gonna put it in the list anyway, just in case people are interested to take a look at it later. There's other things we can talk about instead. Let's see, all right. Um, clash, uh, Lisp as shell. Uh, let's see, there's also, I think it popped up in another window. Something called SHCL, shell and common Lisp. Last updated 2019. And then I think this also uses a uh, reader macro kind of situation. Pretty sure, yeah, okay. So they have a special reader macro where you can type in commands. Um, yeah, so in this shell, you get a prompt as usual and you can just type in normal commands as you would expect to see. And then you can use special syntax for what looks like sub commands and even piping to other programs. Um, let's see, anything else interesting here? And it seems that you can drop into a REPL by typing in SHCL REPL, and then it gives you a normal Lisp REPL to type uh, forms into. Thanks, Gavin. I'll take a look at that in a second. <laughs> okay, actually, that kind of went off the rails. Yeah, well, you know, if you're doing, you know, black magic like this, then probably it will. So here we go. Whoa. So SHCL. And what is it called? A uh, shell in common Lisp. Um, Gavin also mentions Rash, which is a shell written for uh, Racket. Racket is, I mean, I, I guess technically you can say it's a scheme, but it's kind of like a framework for making other languages. So you can't really say necessarily that it's any single language. And I'm guessing that Rash is, <clears throat> excuse me, another language that is written with the uh, Racket tool set. Uh, the Reckless Racket Shell. So this is probably going to be pretty good just because, you know, part of the whole idea of Racket is to make it very flexible in terms of implementing other languages. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Some things in Rash are not entirely stable. Well, yeah. Which, which program have we used on this channel where everything is entirely stable? Uh, zero. Nothing. All the time. Got problems. Okay, so let me just put a link here to this and we'll look into it a little bit more. Rash. Um, a shell written in Racket. Uh, Rash is definitely usable as an interactive shell REPL as far as, as well as for writing scripts. Anxious to hear feedback. All right, so you can have a, yeah, that's pretty cool. So one thing about uh, Racket is that for any file, you can have this little, um, what do you call that? Uh, there's, there's a name for this type of thing where you have like a, um, a hash at the top of the file, which basically toggles what language mode the, the interpreter is reading. And uh, you're running this as actually as you're using Racket itself to run this script. So you can set this up as a normal script in your system. And then you have code in here that looks like normal bash script code, basically. But this is actually uh, code that is being interpreted by Racket using the Rash language interpreter. Uh, also, apparently, you can use Racket functions and pipelines, which looks pretty cool. So, um, let's see. Port string is part of the Racket port library. Yeah, I wonder if you have to... Oh, okay, so they've got kind of like threading operators almost for like pipelines, which is pretty cool. Yeah, shebang is not what I was thinking of. It's, it's uh, something else, and I can't... It starts with a D. I can't remember what it's called right now. And it's not like a declaration. It's something else. Um... So pipelines already st always start with um, an operator. EC Gate says the Guile REPL is my shell. I'm definitely interested to hear how you're doing that because that's that's interesting to me. Uh, Benoit mentions the next one I was thinking of. Actually, that's not so much a shell as it is a scripting language, I think. All right, so let's see. Nice looking shell language. I kind of like this. It reminds me a little bit of uh, F Sharp, to be honest. 
uh, pipeline operators are macros and therefore can play any of the tricks and macros generally can and uh, racket. Ah, damn. I, I So the Gambit manual, Gambit scheme, I think there was something. I'm not going to find this right now. I shouldn't even bother. Nah, it's not a decoration either. Ah, uh, never mind. Let, let's not get on that path because we're going to be looking for a, a word that we're not going to find. Um, so honestly, out of all the ones we've looked at so far, this one looks the most appealing. Um, now, so far, I'm seeing it used as a shell uh, scripting language, but I'm guessing any of these commands could just be typed in at the shell itself. Uh, what I wonder is, does this come with Racket? Can you just load this up? I'm guessing the answer is yes. But, you know, this is a pretty good... Um, it seems like there's a lot of stuff in there that might be pretty useful. And I'm guessing that there's probably some kind of a configuration file that you can use where you can write uh, Lisp code to configure prompt helpers. Let's see. Interactive functions, interactive. Okay, so interactive use, that's where you would use it as a, sh as a shell. Racket L rash slash REPL, okay. Ah, so the RC files are found using list config files. There's a rash RC file. So yeah, you could definitely configure that using uh, scheme, I I think. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me about that, Victor. Yeah, that's that's an important one. Okay, let me go back and look at some at some comments because I think I've missed some stuff. Thank you, Snowrun6. Celtic Orthodox Press says, uh, Prayer says, I was trying TWM, but it kept crashing. Hmm, I haven't used that one before. And you meant JWM. Okay, I haven't heard of that one either. Ronnie says, Nixed browser win. Well, I, I'm going to have to, like, get comfortable using it first. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, in a little bit, I think. Lord Devi says, I can't use stacking WMs anymore. I can. Sometimes it's very comfortable to use a stacking WM whenever I have to use Windows every now and then, like the old uh, muscle memory comes back for like alt tabbing like crazy. Eh, it's not too bad. Let's see. Uh, Bliss, which is a common Lisp bar for DWM. That's cool. Didn't know about that. So that's actually another section we should uh, mention here. Status bars. Because I hadn't thought about that one. <clears throat> uh, let's see. CL launch, which enables using common Lisp as a shell scripting style language. Okay, so let's actually pull that also in here as well. So CL launch. And there's also uh, Babashka. If I type that correctly. So Rash seems pretty cool. I might actually check that out at some point because it looks uh, you know, like it's been you know thought through pretty well. CL Launch is a Unix utility to make your Lisp software easily invocable from the command line. Now that sounds like you're launching uh, Lisp code instead. So you have a script where you can actually run common Lisp code as the script. So it's not exactly the same thing. I think is it's more of like you know using Lisp. For scripting, which makes sense. You can also do the same thing with Emacs Lisp, as we've seen um, with the video I did about uh, making websites with it. Come on. So let's see. Uh, so this is CL launch. Uh, scripting with common Lisp. Or I guess I sh should say shell scripting. I feel like there's another one we're missing. There's like a uh, cloche also, which I think is closure. Yeah, bash like shell based on closure. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So we got rid of that one, got rid of that one. And there was another one that I missed. Oh, Babashka, okay, yeah. Uh, Emmanuel says, I love Lisp and all, uh, but why the need to do everything in it? What's the problem with crafting your system with uh, other languages when they fit better? I don't know. I mean, it's just it. typically on this channel, we've been sort of more attuned to using Lisp. So it's the reason why we're talking about this. I mean, obviously, you can use any tool that you want. 
um, and I will reiterate, I don't know that I've ever said this point blank before, but in my opinion, you don't have to use Emacs, you don't have to use GNU Geeks, you don't have to use anything that uses Lisp at all. So long as you are picking tools that that you like and you're having fun configuring them and putting them together in a system configuration, then you're doing system crafting. So uh, yeah, it, I'm not gonna give anybody a hard time for picking something else and I hope nobody else here in the community does either because the point here is for us all to just have fun uh, working on our uh, system configs and you know, trying software out. Eben4 says, my dad uses Windows like a stacking window manager, no tabs for his browsers, 100% stacks and uses alt tabbing for everything. That would be kind of difficult. And it's kind of funny because I think Windows tried to enforce that even with browsers, making alt tabs their own windows and alt tab as well, which was really uh, kind of crazy. Uh, Fury Energy says, what kind of keyboard do you use? Um, I, I'm using ThinkPad laptops all the time. So basically just a ThinkPad uh, laptop keyboard. And when I say ThinkPad laptops, I'm using modern ones, not the older ones like the X220 or whatever. I'm using uh, X1 Nano, X1 Extreme, et cetera. Let's see. Windows crafting is still necessary many times. <clears throat> See you, the Christer. Uh, EC Gay says, I'm actually a small talker, but I came over to the Lisp side now and again because we're to get together with the last hope for civilization. Yeah, I would say that uh, as far as like interactive environments go, small talk and Lisps are, are you know, they, they're, they're, they're holding true to the promise of, you know, having an interactive environment. Things like, you know, Python and other dynamic languages sure you can you know you have a REPL you can evaluate forms and stuff in them but they're they're not really meant for that necessarily uh yeah lord devi gets it right um i'm trying to see what kind of lisp based tools uh, th that the community knows about with the goal of seeing how much of a lisp focused focus experience they can turn their system into for fun that's right all right so let's take a look at uh Klosh here the last update was on february 10th on the repo uh, this is a, a bash-like shell based on closure. I've I've looked at this off and on over the years, and I think it's pretty good in terms of the fact that you can use both normal shell style commands and um, uh, Lisp forms uh, interchangeably inside the shell. As you can see here, he typed the date command, and then he did like a def uh, for a variable in uh, closure syntax. So there's a lot of stuff you can do here that is pretty reminiscent of shells, but then you have still have the full power of the closure language to run, uh, run, you know, real Lisp forms. So I don't know exactly how far along, uh, this is, and it apparently says windows is not very supported, but you can run it under WSL two. So your mileage may vary, but, uh, it is an option. If you do like closure more as a Lisp style language than something like common Lisp or scheme. Uh, so I'll put the, this here as an option. So this is, what did it call itself? Uh, Bash-like shell based on closure. Come on now, get me out of the, ugh. These default bindings for org present just really uh, drive me nuts. I unbind them and then somehow they always get rebound. See ya, Bill, thanks for coming. All right, so uh, Bash-like shell based on closure, okay. That one's probably worth trying out also. I would say that, you know, out of the ones we've seen so far, Rash and Klosh are um, definitely worth looking at in, if you're interested in this sort of idea. Uh, there's another closure based thing called Babashka, which has got been making the rounds recently because it's, you know, a newer project and there's a, a developer working on it who's um, made some other pretty helpful things in the closure community. Um, this is a fast native, fast starting closure interpreter for scripting. So this is not specifically for having a shell. However, it is used for shell scripting with closure. And I think the idea here is that they build, um, a program from, uh, the, the actual program that interprets the scripts is, uh, compiled with Graal VM, G R A A L V M, which is like you know, compiling Java code to native code. So uh, the idea is to have a, a very fast launching program for running scripts, because if you have to wait for the JVM to warm up to run your script, you're going to be waiting for a while. So uh, this sort of sidesteps that pro problem. 
Uh, has support for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, which is cool if you can do the same scripting on all three platforms. Uh, you can do interop with Java classes. There's multi-threading support. Um, let's see. And you can grab the self-contained binary and just run it, which is pretty cool. You can just grab the binary and, uh, and use it directly without having to have the JVM installed. So non-goal is replace existing shells. Babashka is a tool you can use inside existing shells like Bash and is des designed to play well with them. It does not aim to replace them. So this is not a shell. It's just a way to do scripting with closure. And um, it says, oh, okay. Non-goal is to provide a mixed closure Bash DSL. So definitely uh, not meant to be a replacement for Bash specifically, but it has some functionality. So it looks like... Um, you can even pipe through it using scripts, which seems pretty nice if you wanted to be able to run some uh, closure forms directly in the shell. Benoit says, uh, Grawl and the newer OpenJDK have similar starting time now. So basically, OpenJDK startup time has improved quite a lot, sounds like, which would be pretty cool. Um, let's see. Setting expectations. Uses SCI for interpreting closure. So it's basically a... It's not the same interpreter as the closure language uses it's like a subset so um it's an interpreter it seems but i guess that the idea there is to make it very uh fast to use for scripting so it is something worth looking at if you want to have a scripting language for uh for your your system crafting babashka but it's not a shell so it doesn't really fit in the category, but I'm just going to put it here anyway because it is, you know, shell related. So let's see, a closure based shell scripting. Uh, is there anything else that I missed here? Uh, Benoit says similar to CL launch, sort of, I think. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. It sounded like CL launch was more meant for launching common Lisp code. I don't know how much it uh, gives you a shell integration, but um, maybe it is similar. Hey, crazy chicken. All right. Oh, SCSH. That is one that I was thinking of and I forgot about. So the scheme shell. So scheme shell has definitely been around for a while. I've been seeing this forever, uh, but I don't think I've actually tried to use it. So let's uh, add it to the list. Uh, Eric says I use fennel for scripting nowadays. That's interesting. Hadn't thought about that. SCSH. I think this is just the scheme shell yes thanks ronnie for reminding me uh i need to, i need to mention that one too before we move on to the next thing um open source unix shell embedded within scheme running on all major unix platforms variant of scheme 48 designed for writing real life standalone unix programs and shell scripts uh, it has two main components, a process notation for running programs, and setting up pipelines, and a complete syscall library for low-level access to the operating system. That's interesting. Any uh, examples? Manual as hypertext. Okay, it's got Surfy support. That's interesting. Can we just see like a quick example somewhere, please? Contents. Caveats. Process notation. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at this. Yeah, let, let's get some uh, Bacchus Nauer form stuff here for the grammar of the language, not just show me how to write it. Okay, so it's like this. Redirection object causes input to come from printed representation. Okay, so you're, you're definitely writing uh, scheme. Andre says, my students in AOD can choose a project writing a super small Lisp. That sounds fun. I, I did that uh, for a project in college, too. It's, it's uh, definitely worthwhile. So um, something worth looking at here for sure. Uh, if you like Scheme like I do. Um, let's see. There was something else. Someone mentioned they were using uh, Guile Scheme as uh, REPL as a shell. I would like to know more about that. But, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention eShell, which... Uh, Let's see, a couple people have mentioned so far. Obviously, you've heard of eShell if you've watched videos on this channel. Um, but it is the, it's not a, tr it's not a uh, true po uh, POSIX shell. It's a 
shell that's written in Emacs Lisp inside of Emacs, which I do actually use as my main shell. Uh, it has a manual if you want to take a look at that. I need to do a video on eShell at some point, but I just haven't gotten back around to it yet. Oh, Lush, is that another one? Okay. There seem to be a lot of these, because I think people would rather write Lisp than Bash any day of the week, so they, they tend to come up a lot. So uh, Emacs Shell. But uh, eShell's great. Um, we won't spend any time looking at that because, you know, there's the, the info manual and whatnot if you want to read more about it. Uh, Lush Shell. Lisp Universal Shell. <laughs> Fundrex says, written in C with so many memory leaks. Yeah, you know, it's kind of uh, easy to accomplish whenever you have to write something in C. But that's part of the fun, you know, like if it, if it was a programming language designed for researchers in large scale numerical and graphic applications. Interesting. But it seems like more like data processing than uh, being an actual command shell. So I'm not sure if it uh, qualifies for the same type of use case, but we'll put it here anyway. What was it called again? The Lisp universal shell. All right, um, cool. So let's let's move on to the next uh, possibility here. Uh, service daemon. Now, um, if you've spent any time in the uh, Linux world, then you've probably heard of uh, System D because many people complain about it regularly. For what reason, I don't really know. I think there's just a meme that people think System D is horrible. Maybe it is horrible. I don't know. But you know, m many of the uh, mainstream Linux distributions use it as a service daemon. When I say that, it's like an, an init system. Basically, it, it it manages the system level processes for you, like the system level services and whatnot. Now, we're not talking about system D here. We're actually trying to find if there are any um, system daemons that are written in Scheme so that you can't, sorry, I, <laughs> I, I've got ahead of myself, written in, in a Lisp or configured with a Lisp uh, so that you have the ability to uh, write your service definitions with a Lisp language instead of um, whatever you use for systemd, which is more like an init file format, I think, or INI file format. Uh, let's see. Nova says, I like systemd. Uh, Ander says, systemd is a great idea uh, gone wrong. Could be. I don't know. Uh, but the one that I know of uh, off the top of my head, which I use quite frequently, is GNU Shepherd. Uh, and if you haven't heard of this, then it makes sense because you don't really come in contact with it until you start using GNU Geeks, which uses it heavily, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense because GNU Geeks is written in Guile Scheme and GNU Shepherd also uses Guile Scheme as its, well, it's written in Guile Scheme and also uses it as its configuration language or service definition language. So um, we're going to pull up the page for that, GNU Shepherd. Uh, the cool thing about it is that... Um, Writing service definitions for Shepard slots in very nicely into writing system configurations or even home configurations with Geeks. Uh, because you're writing scheme code already, then you basically just write the service definitions for anything you want to run as a service in Geeks in scheme code sort of embedded into your existing service configuration. There's a little bit of, you know, magic that has to go on there. But the idea is that you're not switching to a different language to configure services in your system. And also you can use uh, GNU Shepherd as a user level service manager. So if you want to run something like, let's say GNU PG or, um, or like it's the GPG agent or uh, like sync thing or any other user level service that you want to keep running in the background, you can use GNU Shepherd to, to run those because it can be run as a user level process as well, which is great. Um, so, Let's see, it, it calls itself the uh, GNU Daemon Shepherd or GNU Shepherd, formerly known as GNU DMD, is a service manager that looks after the herd of system services. You see that there's a lot of um, cow related references here. And, you know, we have herd with an E here talking about the herd that's being managed by Shepherd. And we have the herd with a U, which is the kernel for GNU. So, yeah, you know, we like puns in the GNU community, it sounds like. Uh, it provides a replacement for the service managing capabilities of sysv init or any other init with a 
with a both powerful and beautiful dependency based system with a convenient interface. It's based and intended for use with GNU Herd, but it's supposed to work on every POSIX like system where Guile is available. In particular, it is used as PID1 by GNU Geeks, meaning it is the first process that gets launched, I think. Um, so you can check out the documentation uh, to get an idea for what it is to write uh, Shepherd services. In fact, I could actually show you one really quickly. Uh, let's look at my config, um, shepherd init.scm. So I, I've actually written a few shepherd services. I'm not using them right now because I actually have GNU Home launching these for me. But um, for a GPG agent, I make a service. You're basically creating it a service um, structure, record, whatever you want to call it. And you just configure it with, you know, scheme syntax. And um, you tell it how to launch the service process and how to kill the service process. And you can uh, run any programs like that. You can see that I'm running sync thing like that. I'm running pulse audio like that. Um, also, uh, mcron, which we'll talk about for a moment or in a moment and uh, GPG agent. So uh, basically, instead of writing some complicated, you know, special language for configuring services that need to run, you can actually just use scheme to uh, to, to do this. And you can also really easily test these out. You can, you know, load up the, the file in GNU Shepard um, or have it reload your configuration file or anything like that. So uh, it's not necessarily like a REPL driven uh, experience like you would have with other programs, but it does give you that sort of Lisp centered experience. And you can write any kind of scheme code you want to configure your, your services. So if you need to write something more complex, you can easily do that which you can't easily do in things like system D where you have a very specific configuration language. So pretty cool. Um, there's, there's command line tools like herd that you can use for starting and stopping services. Like if I were to go to the shell, uh, I can say herd status, I think. And it gives me a list of all the running services at the user level. If I use sudo herd uh, status, make sure it's not gonna type my password out. Uh, then you can see like the system level services that are, that are running as well. So um, it's a normal service manager like you would expect to see from system D or anything else like that. Uh, if you use any other Linux distribution where you can choose your own init system, you could definitely try out GNU Shepherd there. Uh, I'm not sure if you could use it like an Arch or Arc, uh, but there's definitely other ones like let's say Gen 2 potentially you could use it with. I'm not sure. Any Gen 2 heads here uh, know whether you can switch out the init system easily. Um, Let's see. Let's see if there's anything else. So uh, Lisp based um, init system uh, service. Can I type correctly? Daemon. Demonizing common Lisp services. Okay. Uh, we, we should talk about uh, system E also. We've, we've talked about it once before on the channel, but we'll, we'll mention it for a second. Uh, Zenodo. Come on now. Oh, this is a PDF file. Never mind. Shepherd is an orphan package in the R. Okay, interesting. Let's see. I think that probably we're not going to see many others like this. I mean, having tools that are written um, to be configured with Lisp or written in Lisp are uh, more rare, I would say. Um, especially things like shells, well, not shells, obviously, but uh, system management tools, etc. So uh, let's see, what does this article say? Not relevant to system D. I think this is running uh, common Lisp apps with system D, which is not exactly what we're looking for. Uh, okay, not loading. Uh, another one that is, I think, more of a joke than anything. This is not really meant to be serious, as you can tell by the uh, the laughing while crying emojis used in the description. But basically, this is a system D replacement written in Emacs Lisp. So uh, if it sounds insane to you, that's because it's meant to be insane. I, I forgot to get the link to GNU Shepherd. Let's, let's do this for system E. Okay. So, um, let's 
service says, okay. Wind Up Boy says there's an infrastructure as code system called Atoms written in Common Lisp. That's interesting. Ashra says uh, there are only a handful of system managing tools, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because I guess it's uh, something that not many people think is very attractive as a project to work on. I guess I should star that. Oh, I'm, not even, I'm not even logged in here. Um, okay, so system E. Using the tools in this repo, I'm able to boot from Linux to sinit as PID1, and from there to Emacs acting as PID2 using script mode, performing all typical rc.boot system initialization using Emacs Lisp until we hit the Getty. So uh, yeah, that sounds pretty ridiculous. We still depend on suckless sinit. So that seems to be, um, as usual, the suckless projects, uh, very, very minimal. <clears throat> and how do you use it. I guess it's just the source code as usual. Uh, files. S in it. Uh, C. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's just it's as simple as you could possibly be for uh, a program that does the root process management, I think. <clears throat> but anyway, basically uses that to piggyback and launch Emacs and then Emacs will take care of uh, running all the scripts for um, launching applications. So system E, let's see, do they have any kind of um, services here that we can take a look at? Files? Boot? I don't know. System E initialization, mounting proc. Okay, I think he's using uh, BusyBox tools for um, doing some of this stuff as well. So it's really just orchestrating the startup of the system and not really doing anything too complex, I think. But it's interesting to look at this because it gives you some clues about what needs to happen when initializing a, a Linux system. It's because there's some things that are being uh, created here, like directories that are used by the kernel, it seems, and there are certain modes are being set on those. Ashra says that might be a nice project, a BusyBox clone written in Guile. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting idea, actually. I mean, all you're doing is making uh, system calls anyway, so you could definitely have a library for stuff that uh, you could use just to call, you know, directly. In fact, well, I guess they've done that already. In, well, in a sense, I mean, Shepard must be doing a lot of the same stuff. But uh, yeah, you still don't have all the, the core system utilities. You, I think, you know, eventually Guile, or sorry, uh, Geeks will probably end up going that route because everything is being turned into a scheme there anyway. Anyway, System E, that's, that's a thing. And uh, it's not really meant for you to use it seriously. But if you want to try it, then it's there for you to try it. Let me pull the GNU Shepherd link back and put it in the notes. No. GNU Shepherd. I'll drop this in. Okay. Here we go. Um, Guile scheme based uh, system, or I guess what do you call it? Service init system. Okay, next, cron jobs. Um, it's another thing that probably many people don't really think to, to write an application for, but there is one in the GNU project called mcron. So GNU mcron, if you've never heard of it before, it basically does the same job as the cron program, which you've probably heard of, uh, which is a service that runs in the background that allows you to schedule jobs to be run on the system at various intervals or at specific times. So if you want to run a backup job at some time, you know, like let's say 2 a.m., whatever, uh, you can use cron to do that. And they have a very um, obscure looking syntax for scheduling these jobs, um, which is always been a reason why I didn't go try to use it because it's hard to read that syntax. It's basically just like a row of numbers and then the command you want it to run. Mcron, on the other hand, is an implementation of the same idea, which does allow you to use cron syntax, I believe, but you can also configure your jobs using Guile Scheme. So this is another package or another program that uses Guile Scheme as the configuration language, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, you can look at the documentation for Mcron to get a sense for how you would write 
um, a job for that, but I actually have one I can show you in my own configuration. Um, so let me put the the MCron link here first, and then we can take a look at that really quickly. So um, in my config, uh, let's see, where is that actually? I'm trying to remember where I actually have it set up in uh, config.m, no. I'll pull it up from my, I think it's in desktop config. Password, sync passwords. Yeah, right here. Okay, so it's in config slash cron. Okay, that's where it is. Dot config slash cron slash pass sync. All right, so it's a very simple example, but I have a script that runs in the background periodically to uh, sync my pass, my local pass repository that has my passwords to a remote location so that they're always stay up to date with uh, whatever I push from other machines. And the syntax here is very simple. You just have a, an S expression with job as the first uh, atom in the list. And then the next one is your scheduling. So basically you can say uh, for the next hour, and I'm not sure the, the actual syntax of range here, which sort of goes against what I was saying earlier, but I think it's like every, uh, every hour basically for all day long, uh, effectively this running this sync password script. So you get to tell it what program to run. And you can have any number of jobs that you want uh, configured here. So if you want to configure your user level jobs or even system level jobs, you can use mcron for that purpose, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, Ashra says, nice part about it is all a functionality in a single binary, which can be a lifesaver if your libc is broken. I think we're talking about uh, BusyBox. Yeah, BusyBox is statically linked. Um, let me just quickly check the syntax for job. Whoops, job. Next hour program. So I want the program to run 15 minutes past the hour every two hours. So yeah, next minute from 15. The syntax is not necessarily the easiest to follow, but I think it's better than the cron syntax. But uh, another place that you can actually use scheme for this. Uh, or if you're not comfortable with Scheme, you could just use the uh, string-based cron syntax, basically, and tell it which program to run. So uh, definitely an, an alternative to uh, cron if you want something that's more Scheme-based. However, you're probably not going to be writing this very often, so it's really up to you whether you want to use it. Obviously, I'm a Scheme fan, so that's the reason why I'm using it. Uh, let's see, Lisp-based cron. Is there any other instance of this? There's a CL cron, apparently. <clears throat> with a reference manual, we'll do that. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for. Suitable language for cron jobs. Time-based music event scheduler, that's interesting. So CL cron may be the uh, other real example of this. Um, I guess you could say that you could uh, just use run at time in Emacs Lisp to do the same thing for, uh, for Emacs. You could definitely write a cron in Emacs, but it would also require that you have Emacs running. However, if you have a uh, if you have Emacs daemon running as a system level service, then maybe that could be your cron if you wanted to wanted it to be. All right, so we have a CL cron here, and that is let's see, is there any example of how you set that up? systems come on so this is just api docs i don't see anything that looks like uh how you're supposed to use it no conceptual documentation wonder if there's anything here oh vendorel he works on uh uh next make cron job say hi start crime well what's the the rate oh this is like every minute by default okay okay so this uh, make cron job actually has um, some keyword syntax you use to pass in the timing for the job, which makes sense. And there seems to be a uh, blog post about it. I could tell you some more about how to use it. So if, if you like common list better than scheme, then you can try to use CL cron instead. Um, but that seems to be a, an alternative to M cron. And then we'll also mention the 
possibility of using run at time in Emacs Lisp if you wanted to do even that. Um, which honestly is not a bad idea because Emacs is pretty good about um, running things on a timer. So next, uh, let's uh, talk about status bars first. And ah, what was it called? Bliss? Let's see. Uh, bliss common Lisp status bar. We'll talk about web browser last. Okay, so modular hackable status bar for DWM. And this does seem to be uh, common Lisp based. So let's put bliss here. Common Lisp status bar for window managers. Let's see, let's see what it looks like. I mean, it's, it seems to be pretty simple, which you know, may be uh, the intention here. Uh, Crazy Chicken says status bar, are we including sys tray? Well, typically a status bar is uh, uh, going to include a system tray, but if you know of a list based program that does system tray, definitely let me know. Most status bars check periodically, periodically for updates. Bliss doesn't. Each block runs in its own thread and requests the bar to refresh itself when needed. Hmm, yeah, that could be useful. Stump WM mode line is another. That's a good point. Oops. Yeah. That's true. So um, let's see. Stump WM mode line. Probably only works if you're using stump WM though. Ah. Once again, thwarted by the uh, key bindings here. So let's see, yeah, we have the manual information for that one there. Um, looks for a configuration file called uh, config.lisp. Uh, you can define blocks with a Lisp style syntax. And you can say what the icon is, what the command is to get the information. That's pretty cool, useful, useful I think. Um, you have, for emoji support, you have to install libxft, that makes sense. But is this what's see? Is this driving the DWM status bar? Is that what's happening? Maybe it's specifically okay. It's specifically for DWM. So let's see. Oh, circadian. Hmm. Yeah, that's a theme switcher. But I don't know if you can do arbitrary tasks with it. Um, all right, so anything else for um, Lisp status bars? So Eric says, I wrote a lemon bar populator in Fennel, but it lacks a lot of functionality by default. Yeah, you could definitely write some kind of Lisp-based configuration language for an existing bar, but uh, Bliss seems to be the only one so far, uh, Lisp-based um, Linux status bar. Probably not easy to find with that search term. There was another one for Emacs. What was it called? Emacs window manager status bar. Let's, let's check that out really quickly. Another system crafters video showing up there. That's cool. Um, damn, there was one that someone had written and I forgot what it's called. Status. Yeah, it's not here. I'm sure that the author of that will probably get in touch with me and remind me of what it is. Okay, so uh, let's keep moving. So there's another one I forgot here, another category I forgot here. So uh, key bindings. Let's see, key bindings. So there's a couple options here that I know about. Um, one of them is uh, K-Monad. Now this is not exactly a Lisp program, but it does have a Lisp style syntax for configuring uh, key bindings on your system. And the interesting thing about K-Monad is that um, it, it's not just for setting up you know, simple key bindings, 
in Linux, it's actually more for more advanced kind of key binding setups where you can um, even do layers. If you use a keyboard before that has a layer functionality built in where you can hit a certain key binding to have extra key, um, key bindings for every uh, every key, uh, Kmoda gives you a similar functionality for uh, for just normal Linux uh, Linux desktop environments and you know with your normal keyboard. So uh, let's see, uh, advanced uh, key binding manager with Lisp style config. Uh, I know that uh, Gavin. I don't know if Gavin's still around. Gavin did a video on his channel. Um, freeborn K. Freeborn K Monad. Yeah. So if you want to check out a video that exists already about this, you can check out that video. Let's see here. Okay. So uh, that's pretty interesting project. Let's see configuration. Let's see if we can um, take a look at that really quickly. So. I think Kmonet is written in Haskell, but the configuration syntax is Lisp, which honestly I think is a smart move because uh, Haskell-based configs can probably be harder to manage. I'm looking for, okay, so you can do things like define a layer, and I guess you have like a keyboard-like syntax here where you have, you know, the keys laid out and various different things that are t attached to them, I'm guessing. I'm not, not exactly sure how that works. Um... You can define aliases. This seems pretty powerful, but I have not tried to use it myself yet. I've wanted to try it, but I have not actually. Um... What is pug? Kmonet is pug. Don't know what that is. Def layer asking for trouble. Okay, that sounds interesting. So uh, anyway, yeah, definitely an another tool you could use if you want to do more advanced key bindings on your desktop environment and you want to have a Lisp style syntax. I think that program is interesting on its own merit anyway, regardless of the Lisp syntax. Um, so someone mentioned, let's see, Xlibar. Gun says Xlibar. Uh, an Emacs polybar-like thing. This is probably the one I was thinking of. Oh, come on. Send me the real repository, not this other thing. Is that the real repository? Repos hub. Could be. Go away. Can't even read it. This site does not show up well. Doesn't even seem to have any uh, screenshots unless I'm missing them. Okay, no screenshots. All right, let me drop that in the list for status bars there's also x bar i'm guessing this is an emacs based status bar okay for key bindings there's also another program i, I didn't realize this until recently i think someone in the system covers discord said this but um x bind keys i think is a GNU project um which allows you to configure key bindings on your system using Guile scheme syntax. I'm quite sure. Uh, yeah, so this is how I actually heard about the CLFSWM um, because this link was here and it, it, it brought me there. But yeah, poggers I've heard. I don't like that term just because it just sounds ridiculous, but you know. So X bind keys. I'm pretty sure it's scheme. Let me double check that. As usual in GNU projects, if no, this is non-GNU, but you know, GNU adjacent projects they typically use Guile scheme for uh, scripting. Yeah, Guile 2.0. Where is an example? All right, so the key bind RC. So this is in a normal um, config style syntax. Okay, here we go, an SCM file, the default Guile scheme configuration file. So you can take a look at this to see how you would use X bind key uh, functions to bind certain key bindings. I don't know if it can do stuff that is as um, complex as Kmonad, but if you don't need all the complexity of Kmonad and you still want a tool like this that allows you to um, to set that up or set up key bindings, then you can use this. Uh, Eric says, that was me. Yeah, that it is right. That, that was Eric who uh, who told me about that. Uh, I was very excited about it when I heard about it. 
So uh, definitely worth taking a look at. Um, another key, key bind. Was it key binding, key mapping? What it really is this? What's the right way to call that? Launch shell commands with your keyboard or mouse under X window. Links commands to keys or mouse buttons using a configuration file. So key mapping tool uh, configured with Guile scheme example. I'll just post a link to that example here. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm totally losing my ability to type. It's like only 7.30, but you know, I'm, my brain is melting. Here we go, right there. I'll, I'll fix it after I put the link on it. There we go. Let's see. Uh, it can be used like, like SXHKD, but it's not just that and does not depend on X. So I've heard of that one too, SXHKD. Simple X hotkey daemon. Yeah, this one seems to have a more uh, typical configuration syntax or just normal text-based configuration syntax. All right, so that's uh, key binding tools. Now the last one we're gonna come to is web browser. And I know that you probably know the first one that I'm gonna talk about because everybody keeps asking about it, uh, rightfully so, is Nixt. So Nixt is a web browser written in common Lisp. Uh, which is pretty interesting because it's very inspired by Emacs. And I would say that it's inspired by Emacs to such an extent that it copies a lot of the core user interface of Emacs. And that's sort of the reason why it's harder for me to get into using it because it's like using Emacs within Emacs and it feels a little bit weird to me. If you never used Emacs before or you didn't use Emacs as your desktop environment, Nix would be fantastic. But since I use EXWM all the time, using Nixt inside of that is kind of strange. But uh, I might change my tune if I stopped using EXWM for whatever reason. But um, it is the Hacker's Power Browser is what basically what it uh, describes itself as. And um, it does have a lot of really cool features and uh, a lot of potential for uh, customization using Common Lisp. You can do a lot of stuff in the browser. Uh, they're even getting to the extent now where I think they're trying to monetize the browser by uh, selling extensions that do things like, you know, provide an RSS feed reader and other things like that. So you can even write apps basically inside of uh, Nixt, which is cool. Wind Up Boy says, most of the Nixt devs are former Conqueror users. Conqueror was written by the author of Stump WM and Rat Poison. Well, that's interesting. I actually used Conqueror <clears throat> maybe in 2013 or something like that. And it's pretty cool. Uh, not, not bad, but, uh, you know, pretty outdated now, I think. Common Lisp, uh, based, uh, browser, uh, super powerful. Um, definitely go check out the website to see some examples of how you can use Nixt. Um, even things like the navigation model, there's like a tree based navigation model where you can easily go sort of back and forth if you're doing research, which might be useful to a lot of people who have a uh, more uh, complicated way of navigating around web pages. Uh, Wind Up Boy says, if you don't use default Emacs key bindings, it might not be so awesome, but I love Nixt. Uh, well, yeah, you could, the other thing is it, it, it has bindings that are very inspired by Emacs, but at the same time, um, you can also set up them key bindings in it as well, which is what I had been using. Um, it works pretty well. I think also the user interface is pretty customizable. I think you could theme a lot of this stuff, which is good. Um, let's see, execute commands easily. Yeah, it has a sort of meta X like command launching paradigm similar to Emacs. It has like a buffer style paradigm uh, like Emacs does. Uh, for navigating to links, you can use like a follow command, which will give you a kind of like a mini buffer with all of the links on the page where you can fuzzy match them based on either the prefix keys that are shown on the link or um, uh, the text of the link itself, which is pretty handy, I think. So if you've used something like uh, Vimb, Surf, or Cute Browser before, it has similar functionality, though it might take you a little bit of uh, getting used to because it's not exactly the same as how those work. But yeah, eventually I'll make videos on this because I think it's pretty interesting. I think uh, DistroTube may have made a video recently about it, but I don't know how in-depth that was. Uh, but yeah, definitely an, an option there. Now on the scheme side of things, I know that there was one called uh, Nomad, Nomad Scheme Browser. 
Um, it is also very Emacs inspired in terms of how it works. In fact, I think it uses a lower level library called Emacsy, which allows you to um, implement Emacs style functionality in any application, which is kind of an interesting idea if you like uh, the usage model of Emacs. Um, now, let's see. Yeah, Nomad is, um, I think, implement or sorry, developed by a single person, and it's not anywhere near as far along as Nixt. I think I tried to use it once before, and it didn't really work very well. But I'm sure the author would be interested in having some um, contributions from other people if you did find it interesting and wanted to contribute. Good way to to, uh, to do some guile scheme programming, I think. And uh, if you use Geeks, it's very easy to install it because, uh, well, it's not in the Geeks repo, I don't think. Let's see, is it actually there? Um, Geeks Search Nomad. I'm betting it's not there. Well, oh, that's not the same thing. Nomad Optimizer. Oh, really? Well, that's cool. It, it is in the Geeks repo if you want to try it out. Also makes it easier to contribute to, in fact. Let's actually check that out. Let's see, Geeks install Nomad. Let's just see what happens. Ah, yes, uh, good good, uh, good point to bring up, Seek. That's a good point. I'll talk about that one next. So um, we'll put in Nomad here. Got it right here. Uh, browser written with Guile Scheme. I, I fully predict that uh, I'm not going to figure out how to use Nomad correctly in just a, one moment here. So let's just see what happens. Trying to launch Nomad. So far, nothing's happening. Oh, okay, there it goes. So yeah, it's got a, a mode line, very similar to Emacs, obviously. Kind of interesting looking, actually. Emacs-like web browser consists of a modular feature set. Um, global key map, control C, L, ah, see that's the problem, I have to switch to EXWM toggle, input toggle keyboard on this, control C, L, URL, let's see, duckduckgo.com. So I wonder how I follow links, can I press F? No. How do I go backwards? It doesn't give me any kind of hints for the key maps. Oh, I guess I could hit this button right here. Control G. Okay. <laughs> Go back. How do I open a new frame? Can I use Control X K? Oh, that works. So you've got similar key bindings to uh, to Emacs. In fact, let me pop this over to the first workspace. Whoops. Uh, Control C one. All right. That's not where I want that. Okay. Um, let's go back to that. It even has a universal argument. Um, describe variable. That's interesting. Control HV. Didn't do anything. Hello. Probably expects me to be in a buffer somewhere. Find file. Okay, so that's scrolling. Control V. Yeah, print out the key map definitely makes sense. Control C U. What was that? Uh, Control C U. Yeah, it doesn't do much. Control Oh, Control F. Okay, that's the one I want. So, um, what was the navigation button? Okay, Control C U is back. Uh, Control M is forward in history. Scroll up. Yeah, it's kind of... Okay, control C L. Let's go uh, systemcrafters.net. I believe this one is using um, the uh, WebKit GTK browser. So you have whatever limitations come along with that. Let's say control F. I'm going to pick um, nine. Uh, you know, honestly, this is kind of nice. It works pretty well you definitely can do some remapping on it but um i'm i'm kind of impressed so far let's see what happens if i go to youtube and try to play video let's see control f um well let me go to a video series i wonder if any of these actually have the videos linked correctly yeah number six 
Uh oh. Just taking a long time to load with no indication. Whatever, I agree. Yeah, I don't know if uh, the, the the page looks terrible. That's one thing I can say for sure. Yeah, I'm not going to try this right now. Anyway, uh, cool to know that that is uh, working well enough that you could use it for a little bit of things. So um, I like that a lot. It seems less intrusive than um, Nixt does at first glance to me, but that's my opinion. I need to I need to use Nixt a bit a bit more to have a better opinion about uh, what's going on there. Um, all right, so we had Nomad, um, and then we had a good suggestion from, from Seek about, um, he says Emacs as a browser, but obviously we're talking about uh, EWW here, I think. There's also the Emacs application framework that uh, Gavin also mentions here, where you can have a, a browser inside of Emacs, but I don't really know if that is something, I, mean, I guess you could say that is customizable with uh, Lisp. Not sure how much it's customizable, but you know, it's there as an option. If you wanted to have a browser embedded into uh, Emacs, let's see, uh, Emacs application framework browser. Okay, so let's do this really quickly. Drop a link. Uh, and also, if you don't know about EWW, use Meta X EWW and it will ask you for a URL. I'll put in systemcrafters.net. And then you have a text-based browser inside of Emacs, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you need to go to a page, look up some information, but you don't really need all the graphical fidelity of a browser or like all the megabytes of CSS and JavaScript that get pulled down, uh, you could definitely use this instead. But uh, be aware that many websites don't work with it because there's no um, JavaScript support, as you might expect. Uh, but a website like systemcrafters.net works pretty well because it's mostly just text. So. Um, yeah, that's certainly an option. Uh, and you can definitely configure that with Emacs Lisp, set key bindings, everything that you would normally do. So uh, it's, a, it's a really good option if you want a more minimalistic browser at your fingertips. Crazy Chicken says, I figured watching videos would suck. I hear that about WebKit GTK. Yeah, that's the main reason why I had to switch back to Cute Browser. I was using VimB for a long time before. Um, and WebKit G GTK, anytime I went to YouTube and started playing a video, it would just lock up the browser entirely or start using like 100% CPU. So there's just some weird issues with that, uh, browser engine plus G streamer, which is the, uh, library that gets used for streaming the video. It just causes problems. So, uh, the cute browser is better because it's built on the uh, cute web engine, like the whole cute stack instead of, you know, like it's like the alternative G to GTK. Uh, it has a lot better functionality, mainly because it's using the Chromium rendering engine or Blink, I suppose. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, Mason says with Nix, I believe you can set videos to play inside of MPV instead. Yeah, well, that's typically the case with a lot of these browsers like uh, Cute Browser, Vimby, Surf, um, and Nixt and Nomad, etc. Usually there's the ability to have a way to launch a program with a target of any link. So instead of playing a YouTube video on YouTube, you can play it with MPV or some other local program on your computer instead, which could be a lot better performance because you're not using, you know, the, the browser renderer to do that. So definitely a good idea uh, for for you if you're using a WebKit GTK based browser, I think. Uh, Amal Videa says, any updates on the t-shirt front? Uh, check out store.systemcrafters.net. I have uh, t-shirts there now, store.systemcrafters.net. But I would say wait until, <clears throat> excuse me, wait until later this week because I'm going to do a Black Friday sale on this stuff. I'll announce that uh, later in the week. Uh, let's see, client-side JavaScript is why I'm currently reworking on my config website. I hope it will be served through Next.js in a somewhat near future. Yeah, um, client-side client -side JavaScript is like a double-edged sword because, you know, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it, but at the same time, uh, it's not accessible to all web browsers equally. So, you know, it's often better to have normal static HTML pages with, you know, CSS styling and whatnot without having a bunch of like, you know, dynamic JavaScript functionality, but some websites need that stuff. So you can't avoid it all the time. 
Um, Ander says that is the MIME support that allows you to define what to do with media downloaded. Uh, started for uh, Emayon, but mode in made into web browsers. Oh, oh, started for emails, but made it made it into web browsers. Yeah, definitely. Ander says, remember when MIME arrived to send files through email and later web browsers? Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, that's all the types of programs I had in mind. Uh, EWW, Emacs, what is that? What is it called? Let's see, EWW. There's some funky name to this package, I think. Where's the manual? Oh, okay, yeah, the Emacs Web Wowser. That's what it was. Just, you know, some more uh, programmer humor. The Emacs Web Wowser, uh, text-based browser built into Emacs. So yeah, I mean, I think we've covered quite a lot of things. Some of these things I did not actually know about, so it's kind of cool to, um, to get a better picture of what type of Lisp-based tools exist in the ecosystem that we could try out and um, and maybe to make videos about it at some point in the future. Um, I'm definitely going to try using StumpWM, uh, Nixt, or Nomad. Um, I use Geeks and um, uh, Mcron and Shepard all the time. So a lot of these things are going to um, be talked about in more depth later, for sure. Maybe even X buying keys at some point. Crazy Chicken says, can you connect to Gemini or Gopher with EWW? Uh, no, but that's what uh, the Elfer package is for, E-L-P-H-E-R. If you use that, you can go to uh, Gemini or Gopher sites. Uh, Windup Boy says, there's a Lisp machine as a VM, interlisp.org. I believe I remember you telling me about that, interlisp.org. So if you want to play with a real uh, Lisp machine, which is different than just a Lisp interpreter program, then you could try this out. Lisp machines, I mean, if you basically take the idea of having a, an interactive Lisp environment and take it all the way to having an entire OS built out of that, that's that's what a Lisp machine basically is. So definitely check that out if you wanna, let's see, if you wanna have some fun with the, the sort of pinnacle of what you could do with Lisp, I guess. I'm not gonna make a big list of these though, because we are running up at the end of the time of the stream. So we're just going to go with uh, putting that here in case anybody wants to check it out. Uh, Andre says you could probably set up MIME for EWW to support other protocols. That's a pretty good uh, idea. Yeah, I can imagine you could do that. Let's actually check that out. Um, EWW Emacs MIME. Um, MIME. PDFs are viewed inline, but this can be customized with the mail cap mechanism. So I guess you could use that. Mail cap files parsed by most MIME aware message handlers and describes how elements are supposed to be displayed. <clears throat> so basically you can just associate a MIME type to a particular application, which makes sense. I think that there's something for X the XDG configuration setup that you could do that with also. But uh, this seems to be a more canonical way to do that. But anyway, hopefully that was uh, useful and interesting to those of you who want to play around with uh, with Lisp more. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think uh, I haven't had a whole lot of time th this week to get back into thinking about making normal videos again. I've been house hunting the entire week, and it literally has been taking all day, multiple days. So... Uh, no time for videos right now, but I'm, I have been playing with my Geeks Home setup here and there with the idea to sort of refresh my memory on Guile Scheme so that we can start talking about that soon and then eventually start getting more back into um, Geeks again because I see plenty of people trying Geeks, using it for a while, and then stopping using it because of various limitations they hit. Um, so I would like to try to raise the level of understanding of Guile's scheme so that more people in the community can actually help contribute to Geeks to uh, smooth out some of these problems. And maybe we can make our own set of sort of tools or maybe like a Geeks channel with some packages and configurations that other people can use to uh, 
make their geeks life easier. So that's sort of my ultimate goal there is to sort of make it easier for people to get into contributing to geeks or even making their own uh, channels and package configurations. Um, and that's it for today, I think. Uh, thank you all so much for being here and contributing. Lots of really good suggestions from the chat today, reminders of things that I've forgotten about, which is great. Uh, always good for to have uh, you know some extra brains around to, uh, to help me out here. And uh, yeah, I hope you all have a great weekend and um, we'll see if I have a video. Don't, don't hold your breath. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I'll get back into a more regular rhythm at some time soon, but uh, I'll still do the streams no matter what. Uh, yeah, mineapps.list. That's the file that I'm thinking about because I actually have one of those. So um, definitely uh, leave a note in the comments if you have any other suggestions for list-based programs people should check out and come join us on uh, the various chats like IRC, Discord. Uh, check out the links in the description and in the uh, live chat box there. And uh, as always, thanks so much for watching and happy hacking. We'll see you next time. See ya.